Okay, so let's uh, dive into uh, the country of the blind. Um, so first, it takes place, uh, at least, you know, fictionally, um, takes place near the Andes uh, Mountains in Ecuador. Uh, so just so you get an idea, uh, there it is on the map. Um, and then a theme that I want us to focus on, uh, and it's very much tied with uh, socialism, like we discussed in the introduction. Uh, the two ideas are tied together in many ways. Um, it will be, I want to look at utopia as we uh, read the text. Utopia is a non-existing ideal world which provides us a model of society based on human desire for the material and spiritual perfection. Uh, in the text, you can identify a, in uh, utopian text, you can usually identify a series of characteristic elements of utopian description. Okay, so <clears throat> not every utopia in fiction is going to have every one of these. Um, so something that has a few of them, you could say has many utopian elements, um, but these are the elements to look for. So first, isolation or remoteness of setting. Um, one must pass through an infernal or hellish region to reach utopia. Uh, it's a place that is entirely self-sufficient. It's often excessively clean with focus on sustaining a good environment. It's often excessively ordered to go along with that cleanliness. Communal living is emphasized over uh, the needs of the many, over the needs of the individual. And for a society like this to work, there must be a complete buy-in from everyone. So um, it often leads to an emphasis on conformity, tradition, ritual, uh, those social pressures that... Uh, um, <clears throat> that um, pressure people into buy-in, into uh, um, more uh, conforming to communal type ideology. Okay, so let's look at a few quotes from the text uh, that illustrate utopia in Country of the Blind. Um, so it's a uh, um, isolation or remoteness of setting. Um, so a few examples, there's numerous uh, there lies that mysterious mountain valley cut off from the world of men cut off the country of blind forever from the exploring feet of men he had slipped eastward towards the unknown side of the mountain his track went straight to the edge of the frightful precipice and beyond that everything was hidden far far below and hazy with distance they could see trees rising out of a narrow shut-in valley of the uh, country of the blind uh, that a common trope is that they must pass through the infernal or hellish region to reach utopia. And you can see there frightful gorges, icy pass, uh, water boiling, fish floating and dying. We're going to look at that a little closer momentarily. Um, it sets up a binary between horrors and more pastoral Eden-like uh, country. So the valley, valley, he said, had in it all that the heart of man could desire, sweet water, pasture, and even climate, slopes of rich brown soil, and tangles of a shrub held the avalanches high. The abundant springs gave a rich green pasture, so uh, Edenic. They're self-sufficient. They led a simple, laborious life. These people with all the elements of virtue and happiness, as these things can be understood by men. They toiled, but not oppressively. They had food and clothing sufficient for their needs. They had days and seasons of rest. They had made much of music and singing, and there was a love among them and little children. Clean, they stood in a continuous row on either side of a central street of astonishing cleanliness. <clears throat> Ordered, it was marvelous with what confidence and precision they went about their ordered world. Everything you see had been made to fit their needs. Each off the radiating paths of the valley area had a constant angle to the others and was distinguished by a special notch upon its curbing. 
All obstacles and irregularities of path or meadow had long since been cleared away. All their methods and procedure arose naturally. So you're seeing <clears throat> the country of the blind hits on every aspect of utopia. Um, uh, H.G. Wells was very purposefully doing this. He wanted his reader to know what he was doing, and he wasn't trying to hide it in any way. Communal over the individual. He went on to tell Nunez how this time had been divided into warm and cold, which are the blind equivalents of day and night, and hot it was good to sleep and in warm work during the cold, so that now the whole town of the blind would have been asleep. So <clears throat> let's... um. Okay, so it appears anyone like the protagonist Nunez, uh, different from the others and nonconformist to the given community, would be considered as inferior and possibly as a, a threat as well, right? Threat to the order. Uh, one person not conforming can um, threaten and convince others uh, to stop conforming, and that would undermine the entire system. So uh, we see this here. For all of his mental incoherency and stumbling behavior, he must have courage and do his best to learn. And that, that all people in the doorway murmured encouragingly, right? So um, this person who's different, this person who, who might challenge this society um, could be seen as a threat or uh, laughed off as a fool. Well, I want you to think about, and I think we get it a bit in this story, is <clears throat> in what ways could utopia turn into a frightening place? I think uh, that's an interesting question on this topic. Okay, so let's dig into the text. <clears throat> and uh, um, we might rehash a couple of the um, sentences we just went over. We'll see as we go. Um, so we have uh, 300 miles uh, in the Andes. There lies a mysterious mountain valley cut off from the world of men. Um, so long years ago, that valley lay so far open to the world that men might come at last through frightful gorges and over an icy pass into its equable meadows. And thither indeed men came. A family or so of Peruvian half-breeds fleeing from the lust and tyranny of an evil Spanish ruler. Um, one thing to note here, I don't think we're going to go into it here, and we probably won't even at all during the summer session. But anytime uh, you see something like ruler or king and groups of people like that, you also want to think of colonialism, right? Um one group taking power over another. Um, and that's another way of interpreting a text. And it's called post-colonial theory. Uh, by studying all of the ways that colonial influences changed or affected groups of people or societies or cultures, um, we're not going to go into that. But when you see something like the Spanish ruler and people fleeing from that, um, you definitely would want to uh, think of uh, post-colonialism. So we see, just as we saw in the earlier quotes, they're cut off from exploration. Um, <clears throat> let's see, we're going to skip. It had all that the heart of man could desire, sweet water, pasture, even climate, slopes of rich brown soil with tangles of shrub and bore excellent fruit, right? It sounds very Edenic. Um, also, let's see. I do want to just point out here to go back just for a moment. Um, some biblical imagery here, right? So we get uh, um, all the fish floating and dying, right? Uh, the water boiling. Uh, these are all um, biblical uh, references um, to evoke revelations, right? And the plagues of Egypt as well, um, to get us thinking biblically, right? So, um, <clears throat> and then all the sudden floods, you know, invokes the ark, right? Um, and so we want to have that in the back of our head. Oh, 
Um, there's some biblical imagery here. I wonder if there's going to be some commentary on religion or Christianity or something like that. Um, so he enters this Edenic, Edenic Valley, uh, this paradise, um, and it's cut off from the world. You have to pass through this hellish area. Um, the be their beasts did well and multiplied, but one thing marred their happiness. Yet it was enough to mar it greatly. A strange disease had come upon them and had made all the children born to them there and indeed several older children also blind. So uh, it was to seek some charm or antidote against this plague of blindness that he had with fatigue and danger and difficulty returned down the gorge. In those days, in such cases, men did not think of germs and infections, but of sins. And it seemed to him that the reason for this affliction must lie in the negligence of these priestless immigrants to set up a shrine so soon that they entered the valley. Okay, so we had a whole bunch of biblical imagery. Now the author is explaining this wasn't a time of science. It was a time when everything was seen through a religious lens. He wanted a shrine, a handsome, cheap, effectual shrine to be erected in the valley. He wanted relics and such like potent things of faith, blessed objects and mysterious medals and prayers. In his wallet, he had a bar with silver. And so um, <clears throat> what you see here, and we're not going to go through the whole thing, but what you see here is the creation of a new religion, right? Um, which can be seen as bigger than that. Uh, it can be seen also as the creating of a new cultural myth, right? This is how our origin stories are formed. There was some sort of fear, some sort of tragedy, and so people try to explain it in some way. And in this case, they say we must not have been religious enough. So we need to change that and create a new mythology, create a new uh, religious fervor, and that'll explain uh, these horrors that we had to live through. <clears throat> okay, so um, let me see here. We get um, they had clubbed their money and ornaments together, uh, having little need for such treasure up there, he said, to buy them holy help against their ill. Okay, so that's an obvious uh, socialistic tendency. Uh, so it's, it's definitely uh, pointing out um, this need that when you have a good, true society, uh, socialist, utopian, uh, you don't need money, right? Um, then we'll skip down. Um, I'll ask you to pardon me a few times here. I, uh, um, the PDF one allow me to highlight or underline up here. So I'm flipping between note pages and the computer screen. So just, just bear with me for a few moments here or there. Um, so, um, we get, uh, but life was very easy in the snow room basin, uh, lost to all the world and with neither thorns nor briars with no evil insects nor any beasts save the gentle breed of llamas they had lugged and thrust and followed. So this is, again, a very Edenic image. You know, in the uh, Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve didn't have to worry about um, those uh, fears of insects or beasts. They all uh, were, it wasn't something, they didn't have to uh, fear that, at least until the symbolic uh, fall. Okay, um, <clears throat> let's see. Then they even had time to adapt themselves uh, to the blind control of fire, right? Now we know H.G. Wells really appreciated Plato and the allegory of the cave. So immediately blind people and controlling fire um, and there's some other references to caves and stuff. Um, you know he's playing on this allegory in some ways. They were a simple strain of people at the first, 
unlettered, only slightly touched with Spanish civilization. Okay, again, that would be a post-colonial uh, thing that you'd want to, uh, idea that you'd want to look at. Uh, but with something of a tradition of the arts of old Peru and of its lost philosophy. Generation followed generation. They forgot many things. They devised many things. Their tradition of the greater world they came from became mythical in color and uncertain. So <clears throat> a couple of things here. We have uh, the generation followed generation is, uh, again, kind of biblical illusion. If you ever uh, read the Bible, uh, you'll find many, many passages that list generation after generation, ancestor after ancestor. Um, then how they forget, forgot many things and devised many things and traditions. Uh, they create this new myth, mythology, uh, very reminiscent of the lottery and formation of these cultural beliefs. Um, and also uh, um, um, very platonic in many ways as well. So then we have more generation follow generation generation follow generation there this is absolutely biblical allusions <clears throat> allusions to the biblical um there came a time when a child was born who was 15 generations from the ancestor who went out of the valley with a bar of silver to seek god's aid and who never returned there about a chance that a man came into this community from the outer world and this is the story of that man Okay, so a stranger, again, a person coming in from the outside to a utopian community is going to be viewed uh, at, at least as um, looked down upon or looked at as strange uh, and most likely as fearful, as challenging the equanimity of their community. He was a mountaineer from the country near Quito. A man who had been down to the sea and had seen the world, a reader of books in an original way, and an acute and enterprising man. Okay, so this is a man of society, a man of the city, of the colonial, of the colonizer, right? Um, and so if you wanted to study this from post-colonial theory, you would say, how does this person entering from the mindset of the colonizer interact with the group who uh, uh, he would be colonizing. At least he would want to or try to, as we know he doesn't really succeed very well. Uh, he had slipped eastward towards the unknown side of the mountain. Far below, he had struck a deep, steep slope of snow and plowed his way down in the midst of a snow avalanche. His track went straight to the edge of a frightful precipice, and beyond that, everything was hidden. Okay, so uh, going through hell to get to Eden. At the, at, uh, and the man who fell survived. At the end of the slope, he fell a thousand feet and came down in the midst of a cloud of snow upon a snow slope even steeper than the one above. Um, down this, he was whirled, stunned and insensible, but without a bro bone broken in his body. Now, that's a strange detail, right? If he falls so deep down a snow slope, um, uh, down this mountain range, you would think something would be broken, right? So something's odd there that we'll just um, stick a, a note on and come back to. Okay. He came to himself with a dim fancy that he was uh, ill in bed, then realized his position with Mountaineer's intelligence. Uh, and so he comes back to life. He decided um, he must have fallen and looked up to see Exaggerated by the ghastly light of the rising moon, the tremendous flight he had taken. For a while, he lay gazing blankly at the vast pale cliff towering above, rising moment by moment out of the subsidizing, uh, subsiding tide of darkness. Its phantasmal, mysterious beauty held him for a space, and then he seized with a paroxysm of sobbing laughter. Okay, again couple of weird things right everything gets hazy weird dark phantasmal right spiritual uh, um, 
um, out of this world in that way, mysterious. Um, and then he just has a crazy, crazy laugh, right? Uh, paroxysm of sobbing laughter is like a laugh of insanity, just ah, ha, 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 right? Um, so all of this is a little weird, right? We're going to come back to all that. So let's see. Let's go down to the bottom of the page here. Uh, they were very strange to his eyes, and indeed the whole aspect of that valley became as he regarded it, queerer and more unfamiliar. Uh, you could imagine this feels a little like a dream sequence, right? He's, he's coming to um, life in a dream sequence. The greater part of its surface was lush green meadow, starred with beautiful flowers, and this is what we had talked about with the utopian qualities. Organized, clean, beautiful. And we could go on throughout all this, and it is all um, um, parts of the utopian setup. Astonishing cleanliness. Um, everything's ordered very well. Um, but we get something here. The good man who did that, he thought, must have been blind as a bat. So, as you guys know, although it's not much of it, considering the title of this story... Uh, that would be an example of foreshadowing. Okay. Let's see. He could see men and women um, resting on piled heaps of grass as if taking a siesta, right? So it's such a wonderful place. They don't even need to work. They can re relax. The three men stopped to move their heads as though they were looking about them. They turned their faces this way and that, and Nunez gesticulated with freedom. But they did not appear to see him for all his gestures, and after a time, directing themselves towards the mountains far away to the right, they shouted as if in answer. Nunez bawled again, and then once more, as he gestured ineffectually, the word blind came to the top of his thoughts. The fools must be blind." Okay, and notice here, he uses the word fools, okay, as if he's above them, he's better than them, right? Um, fits very much in the uh, um, colonial mindset. Okay, let's go to the top of the next page. We get a man, one said, in hardly recognizable Spanish, a man it is, a man or a spirit coming down from the rocks, right? So again, very biblical. Um, and so you want to, at this point, think, why is he using so many biblical images? Um, that's something you want to think about. Um, we get, uh, th uh, through his thoughts, ran this old proverb as if it was a refrain. Uh, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Right? So anytime there's repetition like that, First, you want to think emphasis. Second, it can be kind of like an incantation or trying to um, signal that something's changed. Uh, you should pay attention here, right? Um, so you always want to uh, watch out for that. Um, let's see. He talks about the world of sight, and he says, what is that? Um and something that, that's going to be explored a lot more. Uh, you should be thinking Plato's allegory of the cave here, right? As we're um, seeing people who can't see. Um, and levels of reality, levels of education, things of that nature. Um, he's a strange man to them, has hair like that of a llama. Um, and, he, and they created a new mythology surrounding him. He is a man who arose from the rocks, right? So um, they're creating a, a mythology out of him. But so he, uh, Nunez, has the idea that he's the ruler. He's the person in charge. And then they turn it right back, right in front of his face, and ha don't even hesitate in saying, he's like an animal. 
<laughs> He's like an animal. It's like an animal who came out of the rocks, right? So it's creating a tension, a tension that we'll have to uh, um, break in the story in some way. <clears throat> they scarcely seem to heed him. Our fathers have told us men may be made <coughs> by the forces of nature. It is the warmth of things and moisture and rottenness, rottenness. So their mythos, their um, creation story that they've created here. Um, and so at this point, let's pause for a second and just say at one um, level, what this is, is an explanation for how um, creation um, mythology is, is built, right? That it's built out of hopelessness. It's built out of fear. It's built as a way to explain strange things in the world or to explain the unexplained. And so this is an illustration of how that comes to be. He starts talking about sight and the blind man says his senses are still imperfect. He stumbles and talks on meaning words, leave him by the hand. He should definitely be thinking Plato at this point. Now remember the man who escaped the chains and made it out of the cave if he goes back and taps on the shoulder of the prisoners who are still tied up down there, what do they think? He, he, they would stab him. They would be afraid, confused, think he went insane, right? And so this is playing with the allegory, right? It's looking at it from a couple of different angles. They mobbed him and called him a wild man out of the rocks, Right, a wild man using wild words. His mind is hardly formed yet. Um, I think that's a, um, you know, it's it's just incredible that they're saying this stuff uh, straight right in front of him. Uh, but it's also how we do act with people. We do say um, uh, uneducated things uh, right in front of other people. Right until we learn to not do that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. And they thrust him suddenly through a doorway into a room as black as pitch, save at the end there were faintly glowed a fire. The crowd closed in behind him and shut out all but the faintest glimmer of the day. And before he could arrest himself, he had fallen headlong over the feet of a seated man. His arm outflung. So you should definitely be getting the allegory of the cave here. Um, a black room, a faint fire at the end. His arm outflung, struck the face of someone else as he went down. He felt the soft impact of features and heard a cry of anger. And for a moment, he struggled against a number of hands that clutched him. It was a one-sided fight. An inkling of the situation came to him and he lay quiet. So what we're getting here is the start of the argument that'll uh, take on the rest of the story. Um, if this is the allegory of the cave, which ones are the prisoners? Is Nunez the prisoner or are the blind people the prisoners? Um, they both see each other as crazy, right? So you could really read this and argue either side of that question, uh, that Nunez is really the prisoner and these, uh, um, this town of blind people helped him see differently right? See the world differently or not see the world differently? Or the obvious kind of surface level reading is that um, he's going to try to help them see, right? <clears throat> so let's see. Bring him to the elders. Um, okay, I got it. Okay. Uh, I fell down, he said. I couldn't see this in this pitchy darkness. Um, so again, if a person, if the person would come back into the cave and try to explain the world of sight, they would say he's newly formed. He stumbles. He uh, um, he he doesn't act like he's a person of higher society or higher enlightenment, right? Um,
Okay, so we continue with the allegory of the cave uh, metaphor. Uh, the voice of an older man began to question him, and Nunez found himself trying to explain the great world out of which he had fallen, and the sky and the mountains and the sight and such marvels to the elders who sat in the darkness. So the man coming in from the outside and trying to explain to the prisoners the world of sight. Okay, now blind men of genius had risen among them and questioned the shreds of belief and tradition they had brought with them from their seeing days and had dismissed all of these things as idle fancies and replaced them with new and saner explanations. Um, and this is a, a criticism of culture and society in general, right? That uh, um, there may have been a time or when people question widely held beliefs or traditions um, they are, those people are usually dismissed, right? And, and, um, explanations that fit within those beliefs and traditions are then developed. Um, let's see. They explain to him, uh, life and philosophy and religion. Um, so teach him their cultural beliefs. And at last angels whom one could hear singing and making fluttering sounds, but whom no one could touch at all, which puzzled Nunez greatly until he thought of the birds. Uh, so it takes him back to the moments that he uh, entered the, the um, country of the blind. <clears throat> Let's see here. Oh, lost my page. Okay. Here we get another look at um, okay here we get the setup of a, a binary opposition remember opposites that are set off against each other in a text um, oh we looked at this in the lead up to the story uh, the division of day night warm cold right so that it's good to sleep in the warm and work during the cold right well, that makes us question our um, beliefs and structure, right? So it's the opposite of what we would think. And part of it, if you've ever lived in a warm climate, makes sense. Oh, it'd make much more sense to work while it's cool outside, right? But for us, daylight tr uh, trumps temperature, right? And this society, light didn't matter. So they did what made more sense working uh, during the cold so that they could sleep when it was warmer. So, um, and you actually see this in, in many societies where it is warmer climate. Uh, for instance, in uh, many Middle Eastern countries, uh, malls are open till 2, 3, 4 a.m. Um, and often closed during the day because it's too hot to be spending a lot of time traveling and outdoors and so a lot of people take a nap during the day and then uh, hang out at night when it's cooler. Um, so it, we get an indication here that they're reversing the value system. They're reversing um, the power structure. And that anyone that doesn't fit in that power structure is going to appear mentally incoherent uh, and with stumbling behavior. Um, so... What happens here then is basic in-group, out-group mentality. This idea that if you're not in the in-group, you must be belittled or worse than or less than in some way. Unformed mind, he said, got no senses yet. They little know they've been insulting their heaven-sent king and master. <laughs> I see I must bring them to reason. Let me think, let me think. So you have the mind of the colonizer um, and that mind going mad, slowly mad when he's realizing they don't see me as the power of the colonizer. Let's go to the middle of the next page. So we have, um, they treat him like a child. Right. Um, and then he finally confronts them and says, has no one told you in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And they say, 
we don't even understand your value structure. We don't even understand this system of uh, power that you've you talked of. It makes no sense to us, right? Um, what is blind? <laughs> He's clumsily and useless stranger, right? Uh, so none of this even makes sense. We get more about the utopia here, which we went over earlier. Um, you often see a lot of little children in utopian uh, um, stories. Let's go to the top of the next page. We have uh, um, <clears throat> now this is this story is often used uh, for disability studies, right? Um, the country of the blind. Uh, and so here we get a taste of that. Their sense of smell was extraordinarily fine, right? So, uh, and we saw many examples of that throughout the reading. That just because one sense uh, wasn't working, all of their other senses can, in this case, more than make up for it in many ways. Uh, and so this is often used in disability studies to show um, the idea of being differently abled rather than disabled. Um, he rebelled only after he had tried persuasion. So he tried to convince them that he was their king. <laughs> and when they said, you're ridiculous, <laughs> go away, you're stumbling child, he, he rebels, right? And he starts to try to take his power over. Uh, he's the person going back into the cave and shaking those prisoners and saying, wake up wake up <laughs> um, they viewed his thoughts as wicked right so they start viewing as evil they mock him just like we do to anyone in in-group who's not in our in-group we tend to mock them it's human nature and then let's skip a little bit here I don't want to go super long here so let's skip to middle of 764 so they um they show this different differently abled mindset as they um stop him from his revolt they stop him from his coup d'etat his uh attempt to usurp them right and so this is where we start to question um if they were able to show supremacy over him and stop him in every way um, and use their senses they have to a better degree than he could, well, then maybe they're the ones who see the world for what it is. And he's just been distracted by the world of sight to the point he let his smell not be very good, his, his hearing not be very good, right? Um, and so it starts to flip the allegory in its head a little bit and say, who's the real prisoner here? It could be, a case could be made for either side being the prisoner in actuality. So um, then in any society, uh, a person who doesn't, who, like we talked about with Plato, uh, once you um, re challenge your cultural traditions, once you challenge uh, the world as you knew it and start to uh, see it in different ways that often makes you lonely it makes you an outcast it makes you as somebody who it can feel very uh lonely or or like you don't have any hope and so in this case nunez does what many people do they say, okay, I give in. I know this isn't true, but you know what, mom and dad? Um, I'm just going to let you say your beliefs. Um, matter of fact, I'll even agree with you while I'm with you, right? So he says, I was mad, but I was only newly made. Uh, they said that was better. He told them he was wiser now and repented all he had done. Then he wept without intention. For he was very weak and ill now. So the example I just used with, say your parents taught you some things, and then you go out into the world and you find out, oh, those things weren't true, right? And you come back, 
And at first you try to convince your parents, no, this is the real truth. And they say, you're crazy, right? You're um, just talking about sight <laughs> with this metaphor. Um, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, this is what we've always known. This is our truth. And what you're uh, saying are the ramblings of a mad person, right? Well, we often, we might try to change their minds on different things, but ultimately, um, for most often, you can't. They end up still shackled, right? Um, so you could think of an example with this with beliefs on race. Uh, that say you grew up in a household that has racist beliefs of some kind. You go out into the real world and you get shaken to your core and realize, oh man, most of these beliefs just aren't true. They don't hold up when you enter a world where you meet people of all different ethnicities and where you study science and find out that race is a social construct, right? Um, stuff like that. And so you go home and you try to explain this to your parents. But the only world they've known was a world of racial stereotypes or of racist attitudes. And so as you explain it to them, they just think, ah, oh, see, uh, college made you uh, brainwashed you or uh, being in that other community brainwashed you, right? That sort of thought. And now that's one example, something like race, but it happens in many, many different areas. And it's happened since the times of Plato, right? Plato outlined this a couple thousand years ago. Uh, with many different issues. Um, so it's a process that's very inherent in Western culture. Um, so here he is, he's submitting uh, to them, to their will. Um, and I like to make the parallel here with the birthmark, right? What happens when Georgiana submits in the birthmark, right? When she gives herself over to the more powerful Elmer. In this case, he gives himself over to the country of the blind. Um, and uh, um, in both cases, it involves a marriage, right? Um, so they're saying, uh, um, I think both of these stories make a commentary on what happens when you submit to these false beliefs, right? what happens and, and we know how it ended for Georgiana and you guys know how it ends here. Okay, so top of the next page. Um, we have, he expected dire punishments, but these blind people were capable of toleration. They regarded his rebellion as but one more proof of his general idiocy and inferiority. And after they had whipped him, they had appointed him to do the simplest and heavy work they had done for anyone to do. And he, seeing no other way of living, did submissively what he was told. Once again, submits. And they're of toleration, but only if you submit, right? And also, uh, think biographical criticism here, or psychoanalysis to a degree. Um, H.G. Wells, um, he was a person who did not like submission, right? He was a person that believed in standing up, disagreeing, revolting, right, to the point of anarchy. Um, and so when he's saying he submitted, he submitted, you know, that's foreshadowing. He was ill for some days and they nursed him kindly. That refined his submission. There it comes again. Um, so Nunez is becoming the Georgiana here. So Nunez became a citizen of the country of the blind. Um, so he, uh, um, he assimilated to their group. And these people ceased to be generalized people and became individualities. So this is a great commentary on socialization, again, in general, about how it's very easy to stereotype. It's very easy to overgeneralize until you are actually close to people, until you know them personally for long periods of time. Um, our brains are actually built to stereotype. Um, so uh, 
tens of thousands of years ago, if you were a human on the Sahara um, and you happen to stereotype lions, right? Um, so not every lion was going to kill you, but if you were a person who stereotyped them, you were more likely to survive. And so when you have thousands of generations of people uh, surviving through stereotyping, it changed the way our brains work and our brains evolved to a point where we stereotype naturally. That's why it's so hard to escape stereotyping. It's so hard. Um, with, there have been scientific studies that show that if you're given a hundred examples of something that defies a stereotype and one example of something that fits the stereotype, our brain is much more likely to hold on to that one that fits than the hundred that don't fit. Um, our brain, so we have to work against that brain chemistry in that way. Okay, so, um, so then we have uh, presently the most beautiful thing in whole creation as he uh, uh, meets his love interest, Medina Sarot. Um, her closed eyelids were not sunken in and red in the common way of the valley, but lay as though they might open again at any moment. And she had long eyelashes, which were considered a grave disfigurement. Um, so this is a great commentary on uh, the arbitrary standards of beauty, right? Um, in any given culture, they change. Uh, they change over time. They change from place to place, right? Um, different, there are different parts of, like right now in the U S, um, uh, for women, large butts and curves, right. <laughs> are, are in vogue, uh, for men, it's, uh, um, there's a strain of, um, interest in very muscular men, very masculine men right now. Uh, and then there's also kind of the more, uh, nerdy, chic, uh, uh, emo type man in a way um that's a little bit in vogue as well um but there's different parts different cultures that it's completely different right um so in japan there's a very uh um uh kind of what we used to call when i was younger metrosexual um style among men that you know style your hair in all different ways perhaps even wear some makeup and dress perfectly um is in vogue there and, and viewed as the most attractive for men. Or you could look by time period. And if um, just as you look now in magazines and television and there's all these ads for weight loss, if you look in the 1970s, 60s, 50s and look through magazines, you'll see ads for weight gain, for shakes that will help you get curves, be more curvaceous, right? Uh, so beauty standards change over time and place. We get an example of that here. Um, we get again, he would be resigned to live in the valley for the rest of his days. So submission, submission, submit, resign. Right. Um, let's see. He falls in love. He's submitted. He says she will do anything for her. After that, he talked to her whenever he would make an opportunity. The valley became the world for him, and the world became beyond the mountains, where men lived in sunlight, seemed no more than a fairy tale. He would someday pour into her ears. So, again, this is an allegory. He re-entered the cave, or entered the cave, and decides to make a world out of that cave. Right? So it's the opposite of the allegory of the cave in that manner. But again, we could flip this allegory on the head too and say they actually taught him a number of lessons along the way. Let's see. <clears throat> the next page we have, there was from the very, from the first very great opposition to the marriage of Nunez and Mardina Sarot, not so much because they valued her as because they held him as being a part, an idiot, an incompetent thing below permissible level of a man. Her sisters opposed it bitterly as bringing discredit on them all. And old Jacob, 
though he had formed sort of a liking for his clumsy obedient surf, shook his head and said the thing could not be. So you could, um, this is a perfect um, relation to modern America for something like race or sexuality or for different culture. Uh, heck, um, a lot of studies have now shown that the most offensive thing you could do is bring home somebody of the opposite political persuasion as your uh, uh, parents, right? That a lot of parents would be accepting of a different race, but not of a different political belief. Um, and so it can be solid. Um, it can be uh, uh, signify many different things. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going a bit. <clears throat> it can symbolize uh, many different things, but also, uh, um, you know, 50 years ago, if you come back and or 50 years from now, if you come back and read this, you could probably interpret it for a number of other things, right? Uh, so as times change, uh, this the reading of this text could change. You see, my dear, he's an idiot. He has delusions. He can't do anything right. He's coming back into the cave and looks stupid. His brain is affected, right? So all you can do is uh, um, <clears throat> get rid of the disease, get rid of the eyes that are causing his craziness, that are causing his, um, um, his insanity. And then he will be sane. Then he will be perfectly sane and quite admirable citizen. So you guys should know the literary term here that it's irony, right? Uh, the opposite of what one would expect, especially in the next line. Thank heaven for science, <laughs> right? Exact opposite of what we would think. Okay, and he says, um, oh, I don't know. My world is sight. My world is sight. How could I do this? It would be like getting rid of my world. But ultimately, once again, dear, he said he could see by her whiteness how intensely her spirit pressed against the things she could not say. He put his arms about her, he kissed her ear, and sat for a moment of silence. And if I were to consent to this, she flung her arms, weeping wildly, oh, if you would, if only you would. And he does. He submits once again. And that submission, we know, doesn't go well. <clears throat> so let's see. He had fully meant to go to a lonely place where the meadows were beautiful and white with white Narcissus, and there remain until the hour of his sacrifice should come. But as he went, he lifted up his eyes and saw the morning, the morning like an angel in golden armor marching down the steeps. It seemed to him that before this splendor, he and his blind world in the valley and his love and all were no more than a pit of sin. So the idea of once you've seen the world of sight, once you've seen the world of enlightenment, you can try to submit. You can try to go back and act as if you never saw it. But part of you will always know that you saw it. Um... He did not turn aside as he had meant to do, but went on and passed through the wall of the circumference and out upon the rocks, and his eyes were always upon the sunlit ice and snow. He saw their infinite beauty, and his imagination soared over to them, the things beyond now he was to resign forever. And of course he changes his mind. Okay, so... Um, then at the end here, we get, uh, he glanced back at the village and then turned right around and regarded it steadfastly. He thought of Medina Sarot and she had become small and remote, right? So um, he was able to once again change his value structure. He turned again towards the mountain wall down which the day had come to him. Then circumspectly he began to climb. Okay, so the last thing I want to discuss today is the ending of The Country of the Blind. Hopefully I get to it before my voice completely leaves me. <laughs> um, and what I want to ask is, uh, what do you think happened at the end of this story and why? <clears throat> and so most people 
thinks that he uh, had died, right? Um, and that uh, let's let's look at that and read it as as most people read it. When sunset came, he was no longer climbing, but he was far and high. He had been higher, but he was still very high. His clothes were torn, his limbs were bloodstained, he was bruised in many places, but he lay as if he were at ease, and there was a smile on his face. From where he rested, the valley seemed as if it were in a pit and nearly a mile below. Already it was dim with haze and shadow, though the mounds submit uh, round him were things of light and fire. Uh, just pause here for a second. I realize I misspoke. Most people see this as he escaped. He escaped from the country of the blind. Um, the little details of the rocks near at hand were drenched with subtle beauty, a vein of green mineral piercing the gray, the flash of crystal faces here and there, a minute, uh, minute, minutely beautiful orange lichen close beside his face. There were deep mysterious shadows in the gorge, blue deepening into purple and purple into luminous darkness. Um, and overhead was the illimitable vastness of the sky. But he heeded these things no longer, but lay quite inactive there, smiling as if he were satisfied, merely to have escaped from the valley of the blind in which he had thought to be king. The glow of the sunset had passed, and the night came, and he still lie peacefully contented under the cold stars. Okay. So most people read that um, just completely surface level and say he escaped, right? Others um, interpret this as actually he died while he was escaping, right? So he's gone higher and higher and he ends up bloodstained, bruised, um, with a smile on his face. Everything turns a wild variety of colors, gets blurry, um, he goes into shadows, luminous darkness, kind of a mysterious, kind of a um, uh, blurry, you know, um, and sunset passed and night came, right? So people often read that as uh, metaphorical or symbolic in that um, the sunset of life passed and death came. And he lay peacefully content, contented under the cold stars. After all, if you're there and icy, cold under the stars, all bloody and bruised, your odds of survival, not very good, right? <clears throat> so, and I think it's per, per, uh, purposely vague in that way. Uh, one, you could say, oh, see, he escaped the cave. Or you could say, oh, see, you can't ever truly escape the cave. Um, and then there's others who go back to the beginning and they say, you know what? The whole entry into the country of the blind sounds like he died, right? He fell uh, uh, under all this crazy territory. Um, let's see, what page was that on? Um, let's see. <clears throat> He falls, he's, uh, um, at the end of the slope, let's see, 755. At the end of the slope, he fell a thousand feet. Okay, so who falls a thousand feet and survives? And came down in the midst of cloud of snow upon a slope, uh, so falls a thousand feet and comes to rest in snow. Um, he's doesn't have any broken bones. Again, I point out that's weird. Um, and then uh, is buried in the white masses, right? Um, and so a lot of people ask, maybe he had died at this point, right? And that all of this was a passing into another realm or another um, layer of existence. another uh, um, <clears throat> part of enlightenment, okay? So all of those are, are solid interpretations and there's evidence for each one, right? Um, but a note just to finish the day on. 
So in the original story, Nunez climbs high into the surrounding mountains until the night falls, and he rests weak with cuts and bruises, but happy that he's escaped the valley and his fate is not revealed. Right? So it's open-ended. Um, and it's powerful in that way. An open-ended ending allows your imagination to take over, right? And say, oh, he died, obviously, or oh, he escaped, and this is what happened. You could create a whole story for him. In a revised and expanded 1939 version of the story, Nunez sees him from a distance, or sees from a distance that there's about to be a rock slide. He attempts to warn the villagers but again, they scoff at his imagined sight. He flees the valley during the slide, taking Medina Sarot with him. And so I'm not going to answer this for you, but I want you to think about it. Which ending seems more effective or interesting? The open-ended or him being the hero and going and get, getting Medina Sarot? Um, think about why it's more effective, why it's more interesting, and uh, uh, what that says about each of the way that the story ends. Okay, so you can go on to take this quiz. Uh, thank you very much for uh, bearing with my voice here, and uh, hopefully it'll be better for the next video. Thanks.